Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, where are you watching from? And welcome to the webinar. Just want to make sure that all of you can hear me, can see me. My mic is not muted. Um, Nashville, Tennessee, Rochester, New York, Houston, Pittsburgh, North Carolina, St. Augustine, Orlando, Lake Placid, Yonkers, Springfield, Chicago, Maine, Wisconsin, Botswana, wow, um, Sacramento, oh, wow, Texas, New Jersey, San Diego, hi Tammy, Tammy from Cape Cod, um, wow, San Diego, Geneva, Switzerland, amazing. I see um, quite a few Orlando. Springdale, Arkansas. I absolutely love it. Barcelona or Barcelona. I've actually been there. I love Barcelona. Riverdale, Columbus, Ohio. Oh, thanks everyone for coming today. So hi. Um, we are all a little bit in the same boat, I think, right now. So it's it's just so interesting to be able to connect on these Zoom webinars with people from all over the world, clearly Botswana and Geneva and Switzerland and Barcelona and Maryland and Pennsylvania and everywhere. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, this is really exciting. So thanks for being on this webinar. Uh, like I said before, this webinar is sponsored by um, GoFundMe Charity, but all that means is that, you know, I get to create a lot of great free content for you and give you a lot of examples and you get the recording in the slides and you can do with it what you want at the end of it. So today we're going to talk about how to launch um, an emergency crowdfunding campaign for your nonprofit. We're going to walk a little bit through how to do it. What does that mean? What is crowdfunding and how could it benefit you? Is it appropriate to do it right now? Is it acceptable to do it right now? All of that kind of great stuff. So you might hear my children screaming in the background. Um, I have my microphone set, so it's hopefully not gonna get too much ambient noise, but we're all in the same boat here today. Uh, I'm sure some of you are working from home for the first time. Um, I'm entering my fifth week, fifth week, of what are you calling it? Social isolation, physical distancing, quarantine. I don't know what we're doing here, but we haven't left the house in five weeks, basically. So this is our fifth week. I have worked from home and been self-employed for 10 years, if you don't know me or, or know anything about me. But even if you are comfortable working from home, even if you've worked remotely before, these are unprecedented times, right? Okay. So a little bit about me, if you don't know me, mom of two, a 10 year old and a five year old who actually get along shockingly well, but homeschooling a kindergartner and a fifth grader, or he's not even a kindergartner yet, technically is, is challenging finding things for both of them to do. Um, and then also working full time and my husband's working full time too, but it's nice out today. We've got the sun. They got their, some Easter stuff. We hopefully should have a good day today. But the other thing is, I don't necessarily say good days and bad days. I am a Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. I'm a complete, I'm completely obsessed with him. He's an author and a speaker. He says, you have ahead days and behind days. So today seems to be an ahead day or we're ahead of it. I'm also a former development and marketing director, which I know a lot of you are, especially in a small shop where maybe you've had one or more, maybe a lot of staff laid off, maybe you're furloughed, maybe you're volunteering. I, I mean, there's so many different things happening right now. So I, I just want you to know that I've been, I've been in your shoes, but I have not been in your shoes, certainly during a global pandemic, but I have been a former development and marketing director. And my website's there if you want more information about me, if you want to tweet along. Um, oh, Vila Cherie says, I'm obsessed with Simon Sinek as well. He's amazing. He wrote this great book and he has this TED Talk, um, Start With Why. He's also like gorgeous, which helps. But I've seen him speak. He's just brilliant. He gave a talk to his team and it's on YouTube. And he talks about how actually... These are not unprecedented times and we've been through these kind of changes before. It's really great. 
So he's a good thought leader to follow. If you need another thought leader to follow, uh, Brene Brown is my saving grace right now, listening to her podcast. Um, oh yeah, his book called Leaders Eat Last, really, really great. Some housekeeping notes. You are going to get the recording. You're going to get the slides a little bit after the webinar. It's kind of an imperfect system because it's just me, but you're definitely going to get everything. Um, and I encourage you, you know, to share it with other people that might need it, people that weren't on live, people that couldn't make it. I know there are so many webinars being thrown at you lately and so much training. So I'm going to try to make this short, sweet, concise, helpful, um, practical. If you have questions, that's the benefit of getting on these webinars live to ask your questions and get some feedback. So make sure you ask your questions in the questions box. So today we're going to talk through what it takes to, you know, launch, um, a successful plan and launch a successful crowdfunding campaign and how to prepare, how to launch, cause that's a huge part of it, how to promote it. Um, and some strategic follow-up when it ends, um, change your two all panelists and attendees so we can interact. I have my two set to all panelists and attendees. So that's a really good point, Harvey. If you want to put something in the chat that everyone can see, make sure that when you do the two, you click all panelists and attendees. It's actually a really great point. Um, and you can also put it in the questions and the questions should be public and everybody should be, um, everybody should be able to see that. Um, I can hear my kids having a meltdown right now. Okay, so I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna try to do um, a menti. If you've never done menti.com, this is gonna be a word cloud. It's gonna be pretty cool. And I want you, you don't have to use your phone, but this is usually when I'm at an event um, and I'm speaking, people have their phones right there. But I want you to go to menti.com. I want you to go um, and enter the code 140248 and type in one or two words that describe how you are feeling today. And let me see, I want to see if I can get it. Um, let me see. One, four, oh, two, four, eight. So one, four, oh, two, four, eight could not be found. Okay. Well, that might be a fail. Is it not working? The code is found on the screen in front of you. Okay. I don't know. It's not working. It looks like I set this up this morning. Maybe it's completely... Well, we'll see it later, but it was supposed to be a word, a live word cloud that we were all supposed to be seeing. But if you just want to tell me how you're feeling in the chat, that's totally fine. So, you know, best laid plans, right? What I want us to know today, what I, even what I want to leave you with other than some great crowdfunding advice is not to be so hard on yourself. I see overwhelmed. I see exhausted. I see sleepless, scrambled, um, calmly overwhelmed, tired, insomnia, you know, nervous, um, woke. I see, oh, I see too optimistic. I love that. No control, anxious, disconnected. Oh, I really wish the word cloud had worked. Creative and happy to work from home. Scattered, unsettled, anxious, calm. I see a lot of overwhelmed, 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 stressed. So what I wanted to leave you with today is to remember that you're not working from home. You are working at home during a crisis. So we need to give ourselves space. We need to not be so hard on ourselves. And we need to understand that this is not like anything else anyone has ever been through. There's no guidebook. There's no rule book. And all catching up and purging on webinars. Um, that's all that we can do is the best that we can do. So I want you to remember that. I want to talk a little bit about the changing landscape because I found this graph um, on betterfundraising.com. That's Steven Screen's site. Now, there is no guidebook for what's happening right now. There's just not a guidebook. But all we can do is try to learn from past crises and how fundraising peaks and then slumps and then surges. So this is what they found, and you can read the entire blog post 
at betterfundraising.com, um, that link at the bottom. But we are still in the bump right now. So I've been seeing a surge in giving. I've also been seeing a surge in asks, but that's just because I'm on a lot of email lists and I work with a lot of nonprofits. So what we want to do is we want to pay close attention to the heightened way that people are paying, paying attention to this crisis. People are also online more than ever. Oh, and Mallory says drained. I think drained is a very expressive word, drained, like a battery that's on 0.5%. That's how, I, that's how I feel a lot of the time. The reality is that 1.5 billion people in the world are at state, under state home orders. That's so, that's really inter interesting and insane to think about. So we have to understand that this is a great opportunity to be communicating with our donors in whatever way you find authentic to you. Now you're on a crowdfunding webinar, so I'm assuming you're interested in crowdfunding. So we're gonna talk about fundraising today but people are online. And this is the, the most recent study that I could find. Pew Research Center, you know, is my go-to Pew Internet, just Google Pew Research Center. They've been doing a lot of studies about how people are using the internet and how things are being, um, how things are shifting. Um, but the good news is that 64% of Americans say that the internet and phones will help, but they're not going to replace in-person contact for good. So that's good for us, for us fundraisers who thrive on in-person interaction. But if you want some updated statistics, go to Pew Research Center. I'm not going to bore you with statistics. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we're online more. We're seeking connection more. We're certainly on Zoom more. My husband calls himself a Zoom widow. I guess I'm basically on Zoom all day. And, you know, I think the reality is that we're just all spending more time um, interacting online. So is fundraising okay right now? Yes, that's my opinion. You are going to get many, many opinions across the interwebs, um, but that's my opinion. It is okay right now if it's leading with compassion and empathy, and we're going to talk about how to do that. So what I really believe is when you're fundraising right now, you need to be leading with empathy and you need to constantly be rewriting your appeals, rewriting your social media posts, rewriting all those emails to come from a place where you say, like, how are you? Like, we know what you're going through or we never send emails like this, but we had to because of X, Y, Z. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples of emails uh, that can do that, that can do that. Yeah. Clara says stressful with nothing certain. Don't know what's coming next is killing me. I agree. I'm a planner. I have a 12 month desk calendar pinned up on my wall with like little post-it notes and all the green post-it notes were supposed to be travel and speaking and they're all off the calendar. So I don't like to not know what's coming next. All we can do is just plan for today and things are changing hour by hour by hour, certainly day by day. So all we can do is just try to plan for what's coming at us right now. Try to be, we try to be proactive. So how do you choose the best digital platforms? This is a question I get a lot. People say, oh, I want to raise money on Facebook or I want to be on Twitter and should I be on TikTok and you know, what should I be using and where should I be and what should I be doing? Before you jump on a new digital channel, I encourage you to ask the following questions. Is your audience there? Because if your intended audience is not on this channel, or maybe you want to reach a new audience, if the new audience is not on this channel, then I don't think that you should be spending a lot of time you know, and effort spinning your wheels. Can you add value to this channel or just more noise? What can you post that's going to be interesting and unique and relevant and timely, right? Because we don't just post for the sake of posting. And why are you using this channel specifically as opposed to all of the other channels available? What's it going to get you? What are the pros and cons? And can you design and create content for this channel? Because you can't just say, I'm going to send a tweet and then I'm going to put that on TikTok. That doesn't work. These channels are very specific. I mean, they have their own unique flavors and people and etiquette and, and best practices and strengths and weaknesses. Do you, do you have the capacity to manage another channel is another great question because what 
the work of fundraising, especially when you're fundraising online, what it really takes, research, knowledge of the particular channel and knowledge of your audience, creating content that's going to truly engage that audience and measurement and analysis so you can iterate and improve what you're doing. So if you don't have the capacity to manage another channel, that's fine. And your new mantra, less is more, focus over frantic. Amy has a great comment. As a mature fundraiser, I love that at this moment, my most important task is to personally contact as many donors as I can, ask how they are doing, and share how our mission to educate deaf and blind students is moving forward. All the donors have been happy to hear from me. I'm going to put that in a Google Doc, Amy, so I can save it for later, so I can look at it. I'm not going to put your name on it. That is wonderful. Now, I think that speaks to exactly what I've been talking about when I get asked, is fundraising okay? So what we want to be doing now, we want to be checking in on our donors and we want to be making sure that they're okay, especially our, our major donors or, or legacy donors or people that have had a long-term relationship with us. If you can call every donor, that's amazing. I'm, I'm willing to bet that that might not be the most accessible and scalable way to contact donors, but it is okay to contact them and talk to them right now. A crowdfunding campaign is uh, very, very different. And then Ben has another great point. We're doing the same. Despite not asking for anything, many donors have sent donations after the check-in call. And that's what usually ends up happening. Um, hi, Kristen. So Kristen says, our donor relationships have been extremely helpful. Reaching out to them and checking in has led to some great conversations and options for emergency funding. Yes. So if your fundraising campaign is stalling, if you're running an emergency fund or rapid response fund or you're crowdfunding and it's not working, calling people that have donated or calling past donors and even just asking them, like, what have you been seeing? What kind of information can we give to you that would be helpful? How can we help you? Leading with compassion and empathy. That's what we need to be doing right now. And that's going to get you some really good intel on the kind of messaging that you should be using. And it's also going to deepen that relationship, just like Kristen and Ben um, and Amy all said, it's going to deepen that relationship and make that donor really remember you. You're going to stick out. And that's really what it's all about. So in terms of a crowdfunding campaign, there are four distinct phases. One is planning it. Obviously, we'll talk about how to plan it launching it, that's when you're going to get the most donations on launch day. And then when you close the campaign, keeping up momentum, strategic follow-up uh, with new donors after the campaign ends. So you don't want to treat donors simply like they are, you know, transactional, um, like they're an ATM machine. You want to make sure, okay, and you can hear my children screaming outside the door. Um, you want to make sure that when you're planning and preparing, that you have a good message and that you kind of put on your marketing hat when you're planning. Right now, actually what's interesting right now is people will give to overhead and staff costs. So do you remember how we are all so, we were all got so completely, like we got post-traumatic stress syndrome from asking for um, support to like just give our employees salaries and we were trained not to ask for overhead and that's completely fine right now. The first thing you wanna do, get your infrastructure in place. So conduct some research. Is there a similar campaign already in place because a crowdfunding campaign has a goal and it has a specific theme? What are partners and others in the industry doing? Um, ideally, you would form a crowdfunding committee. Don't try to do this alone because it's just really, it's really, really difficult. So you can certainly be kind of like the buck stops here person, but don't try to do the entire thing alone. Set a date for the launch um, and put it on the calendar and create the work plan. So the work plan could even just be a one page thing, like who's gonna do what and when. So it might just be sending out an email, sending out a social media post. Um, it might be, I'm gonna be calling all of these donors to ask them for a matching gift whatever is on your campaign work plan, and it can be as simple or as complicated as you, you need, it to make, need it to be. 
when you're choosing a SMART goal, a SMART goal is specific, measurable, achievable, but also aspirational, I think, relevant and time-based. It doesn't have to be a monetary goal. So what Rosie's Place did here, they wanted 500 gifts in seven days. This is not an emergency campaign. This was a campaign they did a few years ago. 500 gifts in seven days, that was their goal. Some people do an impact goal. Rather than saying, we wanna raise $30,000 in two weeks, some people do, I wonder if I have an example. An impact goal would be, we want to fund 500 bicycles for the after-school program. So you're not giving me an amount of money, but your, your thermometer would say, oh, we're at 200 bikes, we're at 300 bikes. Sometimes an impact goal is more effective when you have a project that's super expensive or you have, it's hard to do impact levels, like $10 funds this, $20 funds this. So how to choose what to fund? This is a question that I do get all the time. So you do need to evaluate, obviously, your current situation. What are your biggest needs? Maybe your biggest need right now, honestly, is to support employees through this crisis so that you have an organization at the end of all of this. And then when you're thinking about that, how are people going to receive the money that you're raising in this emergency crowdfunding campaign? And then you want to obviously talk to your accounting team or your board, make sure that all of the proper T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Look at what the VOA did, Volunteers of America. They, this was the very first fundraising ask I saw on social media, um, a crowdfunding ask. It was the very first one that I saw and I thought it was very impactful because it was from the heart. It was like, this is happening right now in your community and we want you to be able to give back. And this campaign was actually run on Facebook. So how do you choose what to fund? If you're doing an employee relief fund or a fund for like overhead costs, your employees are going to have questions. You know, what are we funding? How are we gonna get the money? How is this gonna help? What is the money going to? Transparency and communication are so important. And I highlight this email sent by the Daily Table. This is a small organization where I live. Um, it's, in a, it's in a neighborhood called Dorchester outside of Boston. This email, I love it so much. We don't usually write to you like this, but this is an urgent message. And then it gives me the story and it tells me exactly what's going on. And then a cost of one hour's wages, $17. So that's a specific ask. It's something I can wrap my brain around. I can see how it's going to be contributing to saving the daily table and helping this cause and this mission. I see the future of fundraising being really overturned and completely disrupted by coronavirus. We are asking for people to support our employees. I love it. We should have always been doing that all along, but we're so scared to do it because of overhead and the overhead myth and all this. I love seeing this now. So some examples of campaigns that are working. This is a theater. Um, this is a theater, the PAPS theater group. And they've raised, you know, $71,000 and it like keeps coming in. Like every time I'm um, checking it, they keep coming in. So they have a little bit of an advantage because they can give you, you know, tickets and a free drink. That's not why people are going to donate though. So don't be worried about, um, don't focus so much on, you know, you give us $10 and we get that. A lot of donors want to give because they want to help. They don't necessarily give because they're going to get a sticker or a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or whatever it is. But I love this, the we, the language of we. We've been amazed that through your actions, you've changed entertainment in our city. So it's not just about a transaction. It's about actually changing entertainment. It's about something even bigger than them. And when you get the slides, you can take a look at all of these campaigns. This is a preschool. And I know there are a lot of schools trying to raise emergency funds because they're closed, they're shuttered, a lot of community programs, you know, the loving and talented classroom teachers, you know, the preschools doing this. Um, and this one, this is actually raising money for the preschool teachers so they can have supplemental income because a lot of preschool teachers and regular teachers have to get second jobs, right? To pay their mortgages and pay their bills. Um, I, I absolutely, this campaign is so great. It's just from the heart, 
read the latest update and just, you know, we love our teachers, not flashy. There's no editing, you know, a video does tend to work best. I mean, Indiegogo found that campaigns with videos actually raise like three or four times more than campaigns without videos. But as you can see, these campaigns are still raising money. Help us save our jobs and support our employees. You know, Goodwill Detroit needs you. And this is why, like with the shelter at home orders, there are 450 jobs in jeopardy. This is, you know, the why we need it. And your gift will, this is what your gift will do. Join us, save a job. You know, this is something that's important to you. Also, I've seen this, the new tax incentive. So I would put that in the fine print. I don't believe that, um, I really don't believe that you can inspire someone who would never give to you and change their mind because of the tax donate the tax deductible donation. Um, it's $300 for an individual, 600 for a couple. So that is important to know when you're talking about it, but it's not going to make or break your campaign. If I'm giving you $25, it's not going to, I give cause I care about your mission, but it might be good to have on your website and have in the fine print of your crowdfunding campaign, because you know, you just never know. So you're going to choose your platform. You might already have a platform. I, you know, oh, charity GoFundMe versus regular GoFundMe. Well, charity GoFundMe is for charities. So that's a good question, Denise. So if you go to charity.gofundme.com, that is specifically for 501c3 nonprofit organizations. And you're going to, it's going to take 1.9% as opposed to the regular GoFundMe, which might be like 5%. I should probably know that, huh? But Charity GoFundMe is set up for nonprofits. And also you can ask donors to cover the fee if you sign up with charity.gofundme.com. So if you just use the regular GoFundMe, that's what individuals are using to raise money for like medical expenses, to raise money for, well, it used to be money for like travel costs, um, but money for, you know, I need to pay the vet or I need to pay a medical bill. Um, and that's where you're going to get hit with all those fees because it's for an individual. It's not for a verified 501c3. So if you are, if you have a tax ID, you have an EIN number, you want to go to charity.gofundme.com and use GoFundMe charity. It used to be CrowdRise. If anyone knows, um, CrowdRise, the old crowdfunding platform, but then it was purchased um, and became the charity platform of GoFundMe. Because GoFundMe realizes that a lot of the campaigns on its site are for individuals, right? Helping individuals. So they wanted to have a separate platform with lower fees and the ability of um, a campaign to ask donors to cover that fee. So when I go to your charity.gofundme.com um, campaign and I make a $25 donation, it will automatically say, do you want to cover the fees? Do you want to cover the fees? Um, so Mona has a good question. Does GoFundMe charity send you money as it comes in? Yes. You have to hook up your bank account to it, um, as part of the registration process. So it makes direct deposits to your bank account. Um, and it does it that way. So you actually, you get assigned a person, I forget what they're calling them. You get assigned like an account person and they will walk you, they'll walk you all through it. Um, Kristen, I like this question. Does providing a dollar amount limit the gifts? As in someone goes, oh, I could just give 17 instead of the hundred I was planning. No, I don't think that happens. I think like what does happen is I say, oh, I was going to give 10, but now I can see how 17 would work better. But if I was always, well, first of all, I wasn't planning on anything until I read that email. You know, it wasn't like I had a, a dollar um, in my mind, but if I can give a hundred dollars, I'm still going to give a hundred dollars. I think it's just to help people eliminate that um, decision fatigue that we all have. We all have such decision fatigue. You know, we're all stressed. We, we just need to be told exactly what to do. And they did say, you know, if you can help for more than one hour. And I think I supported them for like 10 hours or something. But it really just made it much more 
Um, it really just made it much more um, tangible. Um, so Kristen, yes. So the regular GoFundMe is through Stripe, but charity.gofundme.com is different and processes payment through um, WePay and PayPal and then your bank account. So I, Stripe is not involved, but go f the regular GoFundMe that individuals can use, I believe does use Stripe, but I know there's like a huge fee. Another key piece of the crowdfunding puzzle is getting people to spread the word for you. Because if it's just your organization tweeting and posting and sharing, it's not gonna be very exciting, right? So you wanna create a recruitment strategy, identify some people to be your social media ambassadors, um, maybe that staff volunteer board, maybe it's people that have raised money for you before, your partners, your social media fans and followers, just create a really short list of people that you wanna ask. And then think about how you're gonna ask them. What are you gonna to say to them? Are you going to email them? Maybe you wanna put out a call on your website, a call, just open it up to everyone. Maybe you wanna do a combination of inviting individual people and opening it up to everybody. And then think through what kind of information you're going to give them once they sign up. So are you gonna give them bullet points? Um, are you going to give them data? What do you want them to do? So what is the purpose? Do you want them to sign up to share information? Do you want them to wear a purple shirt like the Boys and Girls Club of America does here? Do you want them to take a selfie? What exactly do you want them to do? Um, and then how are you gonna keep them engaged you know, throughout the campaign? The campaign collateral, that's just simply information that you can push out to people that are interested in participating. So your social media ambassadors, you want it to live either on your website or maybe in even in a Google Drive. I've seen um, campaign materials just live in a shared Google Drive so that everyone can kind of pull from the same place. So they have your logo, they have updated data on the problem that you're solving, they have some email templates, all that kind of stuff. If you're creating graphics, this is where you want to house them so people can easily take them and share them. You know, 5 million meals, 100 volunteer events, your gift will be matched. If you've got these great graphics talking about, a, you know, a quote and a person, this is all part of your campaign. I call it campaign collateral or campaign assets so that you're not kind of creating things every single day in the moment. You want to create as much of this as possible in the beginning. And then when you're launching, tease your launch a little bit if you can. Uh, right now, you probably won't be able to do that because it's urgent and it's a rapid response fund and it's emergency funds. But if you can tease the launch day and say something exciting is happening tomorrow, um, especially if you have a matching gift, you want to tease it and say tomorrow your gifts are going to be doubled or tomorrow we're going to go live on Facebook and tell you about a special announcement. We want you to join us. We want you to be a part of this. The key is just to really get people excited. This is an example of the impact goal that I was talking about. Give opportunity this holiday season by helping us build 25 schools. They don't have a money number. The goal is 25 schools. So you might want to consider that as your impact goal. On launch day, make sure you do not start at zero. So if you're using GoFundMe Charity or Classy or Facebook, whatever it is you're using, make sure that you have some money in there. Because remember the rule about tip jars. Nope, for some reason, nobody likes to be the first person to put money in the tip jar. Make sure you're not sending your launch email out and then having it go out and having it be at zero. So you've got to have some, some donations in there. Uh, make sure that board members, if they're asking people for money, that they are giving money because you better believe if my friend Bonnie asks me for money for something and I go check the crowdfunding campaign and her name isn't on it, that looks weird. So anyone that's asking for money, so your staff members might not be asking, that's fine. If, if anyone is asking for money, they need to make their donations first. And then they have to, sh yeah, they have to show that they've also given. Your launch email should be short and sweet and to the point. Don't, you know, couch this launch in your long email with your 25 events and your other 95 announcements. It needs to be a specific dedicated email. 
and it needs to be really short and sweet and to the point, hopefully linking to a video where I can watch rather than read more information. But the key is to get people excited. If you have a match to talk about the match, if you have something especially exciting going on, talk about that, but then direct people to the campaign where they can make a gift. Call the first few donors and thank them for their contribution. If you have their phone number, you can also email them just like the um, San Francisco Playhouse did here. You know, I know you already got an automated response, but I wanted to make sure you knew right away how much your gift is appreciated. So call those first few donors and then see if they would share the campaign with five of their friends. That's what I usually recommend doing. And then of course the thank you that you're gonna send is really important. You've just changed lives. It's like you didn't just give us $10, you changed lives. This is what you did. We're so grateful, we're so thankful. Consider leveraging social media during the crowdfunding campaign to thank donors. So this is what No Kid Hungry did. They did a wall of thanks on Giving Tuesday a couple of years ago. And what I think right now you could probably do a virtual wall of thanks or you could do a Zoom call where staff members are talking about what they're thankful for and thanking donors and thanking corporate sponsors. But they did a full 24 hours of thanks and they put notes up on their wall and they had staff come to the camera and it was all done with a smartphone and a tripod. Once you launch the campaign, all channels should be focused on the campaign. So your email signature, your Facebook cover photo, um, your website, everything should be pretty much focused on this emergency campaign because you know people don't think you're going to inundate your donors. Your donors will be lucky if they see one post because we know how organic post has organic reach has been completely decimated. Um, so you want to make sure you're sharing that campaign video, you're sharing that campaign message. If you do a live stream, update people in the comments, make sure you're changing it. I really think launching a crowdfunding campaign with a live stream works the best because it's something interesting. It's going to give you algorithm juice, Facebook, the Facebook algorithm loves Facebook Live. You can keep the video after and it can be an asset that you promote again, again, and again. And you can either put your link like they do here, they put their outside link to their fundraising page or you can add a donate button to it. Make sure you're using Twitter, make sure you're using Instagram, make sure you have that compelling ask, you know, this is urgent, this is our campaign, this is what we're doing, the matching gift is only good for 24 hours, here's the link, here's the link, here's the link, make your donation. These are two Facebook ads that I saw that I thought were very effective. These are campaigns that are running on Facebook. So when they have the donate button, that means you can just donate via Facebook in two clicks. So I love this one, feed a family for the holidays, your $20 gift does X, Y, Z, right? So letting people know that is effective. I do think that helps, especially with online fundraising. In a direct mail appeal, you might wanna up the ask, but online, people are usually impulse giving. And step three is keeping up the momentum. This is where you're gonna continue promoting the campaign, you're gonna be enthusiastic, you're gonna um, capture your, the contact information, you're gonna see what's working, you're gonna tweak as you go, and you know, you're gonna hopefully have fun. I would recommend sending frequent updates on the progress of your campaign. You know, Make your gift today so we can reach our goal. We're almost halfway there. Thank you to everyone who's helped donate to our campaign. Here's what we have left to do. So just keep focused on the updates and letting people know how they can participate in this campaign. And the key, I think, with the promotion is obviously you're not just saying donate, 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 donate in every post, right? You're gonna share a story, you'll share a photo, you'll share an update, you'll share something that's interesting. It's not just the same old donate, donate every single time. This is a great one on Instagram. The key is really in the framing of the ask. So help us help dogs like Ricky Bobby. It's not give us $25. It's join our movement, 
join us. It's inviting people to be a part of something bigger than they are. And then step four is follow up. This is hugely important. How are you going to be stewarding these new donors that you're gathering through this campaign? Um, you'll be communicating with them. You'll be saying thank you. You know, you're going to call out people that gave. You're going to call out, hopefully, and say thank you to people that shared the message. Um, maybe you'll have a virtual campaign party at the end and you're going to talk about your learnings and you're going to talk about if you reach the goal, you'll celebrate. If you didn't reach the goal, what could you have learned? And then I always recommend calling donors wherever you can. And you see just from what um, Amy said, what Ben said, what Kristen said, reaching out to your donors to thank them, to get feedback, to ask them how they're doing, to see you know, what's changed in their life and, and how your nonprofit still fits into it. It's going to give you great, not just intel on your donors, but it'll give you a great sense of community and creating that shared identity with our donors, which is what we want to do. I recommend, you know, creating an email welcome campaign so people feel welcomed right away. Say I made a $10 donation and it was kind of just a test and I could give more, but I just was testing you. The welcome that I get is so important. So send welcome emails, you know, share stories, try to get people more involved immediately, whether that's just asking them for feedback, whether that's asking them to volunteer, maybe it's just asking them to watch a video, but try to get that, that um, involvement and participation right away. So some battle tested tools. Um, Canva, Animoto. Canva is for graphic design, so you can create totally for free. Um, I will put this link in the panelists and attendees. Most of you know Canva and love Canva, and if you love it, you're jumping up and down. But if you don't know about it, it's going to save you thousands of hours, and it's a graphic design dream. It's so easy to do. Animoto is for really short video. And then Word Swag is a mobile app. It's a graphic design mobile app. I don't like the Canva app very much. I like Canva on desktop. So that's kind of my favorite mobile app. All of the graphics you see here have been created with Canva. In terms of scheduling updates and scheduling posts, I use Hootsuite, I use Buffer, um, and Buzzsumo is a really neat way to find out what keywords are trending, what people are searching on, what people are thinking about. Um, what topics are kind of top of mind. And I think we know which topic is the most top of mind right now, but I'm sure there are other topics that your donors and supporters are thinking about and searching for. So the key, the key with any, any fundraising campaign, whether it be an emergency crowdfunding campaign, whether it be your annual appeal letter, whether it just be uh, a campaign that you run because you really need to keep the lights on, you have to think about what donors want and why they give. And they give to make an impact, to give back, to create a meaningful life. They want to know, I mean, people that give money, they want to support causes and they want to support people that they care about. And they want to support, you know, they want to end problems and they want to find solutions to societal injustices and everything that we are working on today. Even if you are not a COVID-19 emergency responder, even if you're not a hospital, even if you're not a healthcare worker, your donors care about your mission. Okay, I've been seeing some successful, like look at that movie theater crowdfunding campaign or the preschool crowdfunding campaign, or I saw you know a little um, camp that where I live, a museum, a little tiny museum, historical museum where I live, sending out appeals because it's desperate times. And, you know, I, I heard something on another webinar this morning. You can't constantly cry wolf, okay? You can't constantly be telling your donors, we're going to close our doors tomorrow. This is the last chance. We're going to close our doors tomorrow. You can do that right now, though. I mean, you really can because it's, I know that that's the reality for a lot of people on this webinar. Don't think that you can constantly say that to your donors because they're going to get tired of hearing that and then they're not going to believe you anymore. It's very, very similar um, Boy Who Cried Wolf. But what they want to know 
is that they want to know that you're being proactive. They want to know that you have some kind of plan in place. I mean, as much as possible, you have some kind of contingency plan. You are focused, you are enthusiastic, you're passionate, like you're going to get through this and you need their help to get through this. And even if getting through this means you look very different at the end, that's okay. That's okay. So be sure to give your donors evidence of the impact, stories, opportunities, um, and chances to spread the word. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I see a lot of questions coming in. Um, I will answer as many as I can. Um, and then I was, I really wanted to, you know, only take about an hour of your time, but I will see what the questions are. Okay. Should you, or can you run a crowdfunding campaign in conjunction with Giving Tuesday Now. So if you haven't heard of Giving Tuesday Now, the organization Giving Tuesday, this is the website, it's now.givingtuesday.org. They want to amplify the need created by COVID-19 and the important work of the sector through an emergency Giving Tuesday. So this is the emergency Giving Tuesday is going to be on May 5th. This is not the quote unquote real Giving Tuesday. That one is going to be still on December 1st, 2020. But this is for us to talk to our donors and our supporters and absolutely a chance to run a crowdfunding campaign. I think so. If you've got a great message, if you've got an excited audience, if you have a very compelling ask, I think absolutely it's appropriate. But of course, there are so many ways to engage your community on May 5th that don't involve, and I'm just going to go to my, I'm just going to share one of my blog posts with you because this is something I feel passionate about. You don't have to raise money on Giving Tuesday at all or Giving Tuesday now. So on this blog post, and I'm going to put this link in the chat for you, 10 ways to participate without asking for money. So thanking donors, calling them, set, you know, doing a series of staff stories. There's a lot of ways that you can participate without asking for money. Because what I know is a lot of us already have giving days scheduled for May or for June, or we might already have um, campaigns scheduled. So if you wanna leverage it to ask for money, that's totally appropriate, but there's a lot of other things you can do, or you could just ignore it. It's not mandatory, right? Um, if nonprofits, as a sector are struggling with the question of whether or not to ask people for donations. Hold on, I wanna make sure that I do this. How can we help our network feel okay about spreading the word? Um, that's, no, I mean, you if you're not comfortable, then don't do it. But I think you should be communicating with your donors, even if you're not asking, even if you're not asking them for money, you, you should be talking to them and telling them exactly what's going on because they want, they want to know. I think that there's so many uncertain things happening in their lives. Certainly, you know, if you're Victoria's Secret and you're sending out some stupid email that I keep getting emails from them saying how, you know, you're making employees wash their hands, that's not relevant to my life. But the causes that I support, I want to hear from them and I want to know how I can help. And if I can help, I will. If I can't help, I won't but give them the opportunity to make that choice, you know, and have that agency. John has a good question. Is the concept of social media ambassadors the same concept as peer-to-peer -peer fundraising? Not necessarily. So social media ambassadors can be people that simply are sharing information about your campaign or your nonprofit. So they don't necessarily have to be starting a fundraising campaign for you. Because peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is when I say, I'm going to start a fundraiser for um, the Wenham Museum, and I'm going to ask all my friends and family to donate to my fundraiser. That's peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, like races, having a race team, um, having a walk team. So social media ambassadors honestly could just be helping you spread the word about your campaign, about a great video that you have, about a great initiative that you have. Um, so I don't see them as the same thing. They certainly can overlap. Um, Susan says, you mentioned using Facebook for a campaign vehicle. We use this some, 
But one of the things we found is we cannot follow up with a donor. Um, any suggestion on how to get this info? Do people use GoFundMe as a campaign vehicle and then promote via Facebook? Yes, so there's a lot of things to unpack here. So one is if you raise money on Facebook, that is Facebook charitable giving tools, the donate button and birthday fundraisers, you are not going to get the information on your donors unless they elect to give it to you, which a lot of people do not. So that is the challenge of Facebook fundraising. You certainly can create a GoFundMe charity link and promote it via Facebook. You can promote it via Twitter. You can promote it anywhere that you want, but Facebook won't let you use the donate button unless it's a Facebook fundraiser. So those ads that you saw and any posts that you see, any examples that I, sh that I shared, um, if it has the donate button on it, that has to go through Facebook. So you're welcome to share any link that you want. You can get a button that says learn more. You can get a button that says sign up, but they want complete control over the donate button if that makes sense. So certainly I would start a campaign on GoFundMe charity and I would promote it via Facebook. I'd promote it via your email. I'd promote it really pretty much anywhere um, and everywhere that you want. And I have a great link to share with you that, forgive me if um, we see my calendar for a minute. Here it is. This is the link that I wanted to share with you. And that's gonna really walk you through exactly how to start your fund if you decide to use GoFundMe. You have to claim your charity and all that means is similar to Facebook, you have to give them your EIN number and your official work email. So, you know, Julia at KentuckyNonprofit.org. Um, and then it should take 24 to 48 hours and then you can start fundraising. If you as a person, an individual, if you want to start a fundraiser, you can just go to GoFundMe and start a fundraiser. Um, but there are going to be, you know, price, there's going to be a lot more, um, there's going to be fewer hoops to jump through, but it's going to cost you a lot more, um, as you go. Okay. I love this. Uh, let's see where the questions are. Okay. Denise, we're on the front lines helping refugees in our city who have no access to resources because of language barriers. We're asking not for us, but them. Um, but my message has stalled. So I'm thinking that there are several reasons why fundraising campaigns stall. Um, number one is people don't understand the purpose of the campaign. So they can't really wrap their brain around what the money is going to, um, or they haven't been shown the impact. So you need to you know, be able to convey exactly what your vision is for this money. Like, what are you hoping to accomplish? And paint me a picture of the world if you don't raise the money and paint me a picture of the world if you do raise the money. And what does that look like? And what's the contrast? Where's the urgency? Because fundraising, you know, if you're just making people feel good and telling them some feel good stories and some happy stories, there's no urgency there. There's no urgency that I have to give, I have to stop this thing from happening, or I have to give so that I can make this thing happen. Because people know that they can just go to your website and give anytime they want. So why now and why this? I think those are the two most important questions you can answer. Why now and why this? All right, Emily, great question. Does it split your audience too much to run both a Facebook campaign and a GoFundMe charity campaign? Yes, I mean, the, the issue is that you can't link the two. So you're gonna have a Facebook fundraiser on the one hand that has raised a certain amount. And then you're gonna have the, let me see if I can see a sample of a campaign. You're going to have the you know, charity.gofundme.com campaign that's going to be on the other side of it. So you'll have an amount in your thermometer on GoFundMe 
and you'll have an amount in your thermometer on Facebook, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna sync up together. So it'll be harder for you to consolidate everything in one place. And it's going to be harder for you to update people because you're going to have to constantly monitor both. I have seen people that do both, certainly, because at the end of the day, it really is all about the money. It's getting the money so that we can fulfill our mission. And kind of, it doesn't really matter where it comes from. Like $20 to me is $20. Um, if you send me a $20 bill in the mail, I'll take it, even if I don't know your name. But if you're looking for like cohesion and consistency, uh, it is going to be it is going to be a little bit challenging. Um, Gabrielle says, "How effective and successful are birthdays for a cause where an individual raises money for his or her nonprofit? Um, you know, before or during her birthday, those are so successful. That is where all the money on Facebook comes in. So the money that is raised on Facebook specifically." 99% of it are birthday fundraisers, people donating their birthday to a cause and asking their friends and family. So I, that's, I'm going to go and say 99%. It might be 90%, but it's a huge chunk of it. But you can do it on any platform that you want. I've seen it on Classy. I've seen it on GoFundMe. I've seen it on any number of fundraising platforms where people donate their birthday. But that's hugely effective. There are a couple tips that I would give you if you're thinking of, you know, running a birthday fundraiser. One is that the market is getting kind of saturated now, especially on Facebook. So to stand out, you do need to have that personal story. You can't just say, here's my birthday fundraiser, give me 20 bucks because kind of everybody does that. And it's the templated language and we've seen it a million times, but if you can say, I want to raise $200 this birthday in honor of my friend, Karen. She's struggling with this and X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. If you can give me a story and connect me to your birthday fundraiser, it's going to raise, it's going to raise more money and cut through the clutter. Oh goodness. Okay. Samuel says we are an NGO for other NGOs. Basically we create campaigns <clears throat> for other nonprofits. Hmm. We usually use key performance indicators based on the specific NGO we're working with. Can you suggest a way around creating smart goals? Um, no. <laughs> so if you run a, if you run a crowdfunding campaign, you have to tell people how much you're raising money for. So the only way around it is an impact goal, which is we want to raise this, we want to raise money to fund five education programs. That's the way around it. But a crowdfunding campaign by nature is specific. It has, it's measurable and it's time-based. So you're not running a crowdfunding campaign for a year. You're running it for a couple of weeks. You're running it for a month. It's gonna, it has an end game. Um, but the way around that is to create an impact goal where you're not announcing the dollar amount. Um, Okay, Emily says, these are great questions. You showed ads, oh, you showed examples of ads asking ads for fundraising campaigns. Do you think ads asking to donate turn people off um, since you clearly have the money to run an ad? No, I don't think so. So those ads raise a lot of money for those organizations. Now it's because they're successful because it's, they're raising money for something that's in the news. I want to show you some examples. Where is my, my Google Drive? Hold on, nonprofit comms. So I have a Google Drive um, of examples that I've been collecting. I'll put it in the chat. Um, yeah, so I'll put it in the chat. This is the, this is my Google drive of all of my examples <laughs> that I've been collecting. So I have a lot of social media updates and fundraising examples. Oh, I forgot. You can't really see the picture here, but anyway, the, I've seen ads that have been really successful because they're very topical. They can answer the why now and why this, and you don't have to spend a lot of money. You could spend $20 on an ad and raise $200 and I think that's money well spent. You know, I, I think we, we have to get over this like starvation cycle and martyrdom of nonprofits that 
we can't spend any money. Like if you have a development director, then technically you're spending money on fundraising. So I, I just think that donors, you know, they, they don't necessarily give because they see, oh, you, I mean, I guess if you sent them some crazy direct mail appeal that looks like it cost 50 bucks, that's different. But online ads are so cheap. And actually that's a good, a good point that I want to make right now is ads are really, really cheap right now because not a lot of people are, are advertising. So you can actually reach even more people with like $10, $50 than you could at any other time. So if you have a campaign where you can answer the why this, why now, even paying $10 just to make sure that more of your donors see it, I think is money well spent. Uh, let's see, I see so much in the chat. Monica says, um, that's why I like, if you have a question, can you, if you put it in the questions, cause the chat is just too crazy right now. Monica says, does GoFundMe charity Provide a list of donor info. Yes. Do donors get their receipts from us or GoFundMe sends them? So they get an automatic receipt from GoFundMe, but it is up to you to send that like, thank you. Um, that welcome email, welcome to our organization. You know, here's five things you need to know about us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is up to you to cultivate them, but it, it's they do get a tax receipt from um, Go fund me. Um, let's see. All right. I'm only going to answer, drop us your folder in the follow-up email. Yes. So the, the folder that I shared with you, um, I will absolutely put it in the follow-up email and I will we'll write that down. It's, you can't add to it. If you have a campaign that you would like to add to it, uh, let me know. But I didn't want everybody just kind of adding to it. Willie. Nilly NPCOMS folder. I'll send it to you, the bit.ly link. And I keep adding to it. It's a lot in there. It's kind of overwhelming. Um, thank you for the photo. And then, you know, it's funny. Don't look at the armchair of the desk of the chair. <laughs> the arm of the chair. I realized I got a new desk. I got a new desk. I mean, I got a new chair since that photo. All right. This is the, la this is, um, the last question. I think it's a good question. We launched just last week an emergency relief fund campaign for members of our association, freelance photojournalists who've lost their entire livelihoods. Um, and it's going really well, 20K and going strong. But our organization itself is in dire straits and we need to raise funds to sustain our operations. How can we run a campaign for the organization without taking away relief from the relief fund. Well, I think, I mean, the real issue is I don't think, I think that anytime you're asking for something, it's taking away from something else. So people, people need to understand the difference. So this, you know, it's sort of like a community foundation. A community foundation is asking for money to go into the COVID-19 relief fund to support nonprofits, but then they can also be asking for themselves but you have to be really creative in that messaging and understand that yes, one might take away from the other, but people are gonna give to what they find is the most compelling cause and the most compelling, you know, the sort of the most compelling ask, What's, what are they gonna react with emotionally? So I can't tell you 100% for sure, but I, I do know that if I get two asks and I can only do one, I'm going to pick the one that resonates the most with me emotionally. Um, and I think that is a challenge, especially if you are a grant making organization or a membership organization and you know, you're really trying to support your members, but maybe a better way to do it is to support these freelance journalists to do their own crowdfunding campaigns um, or to, cause I've seen that actually a lot in my social media feed. I've seen like my makeup artist friends, my hairstylist friends, my photographer friends, all running their own little mini GoFundMes, um, either giving like photography tips away or makeup tips or hair tips and asking people, you know, to donate because they are, they've all lost their livelihood. I even saw like a bartending course online 
someone, you know, showing people how to make drinks and asking for like a $5, $10 donation. If you watch the Facebook live, I mean, there's so many, there's so much need out there. Everyone is just, everyone's just trying to make do and get creative. Um, but all of you are doing amazing, amazing work. I really thank you. Thanks for gambling on this webinar. I will send you all of the information, uh, either tonight or tomorrow. I would appreciate it if you shared with someone else that might need it, um, someone else in your organization or another nonprofit. And I just hope to see you in the Facebook group. Hope to see you via email or virtually or on another webinar. So thank you. Oh, and hi, Sarah. I see so many familiar names. I'm so excited. Um, thank you for coming. And remember, give yourself grace. Don't be hard on yourself. You're doing amazing work. Your mission is worth it. You are worth it. And we, we will attempt to get through this and we're definitely stronger together. So I will talk to you all soon. Take care.